So the past decade can be described with one phrase, world shattering. The people knew that they were pioneers in this brand new world that would actually split time in half. In the past 10 years since Jesus' ascension, the disciples were making waves. This group of 11 who would not follow the Lord to Calvary was now changing the entire socio-political system and flipping it on its head. These men had seen Jesus rise from the grave and ascend into heaven were left with a mission. They were to go out and share the gospel with the entire world. But they were not alone. They were promised the Spirit. The Spirit, this very person and presence of God who split the Red Sea, who spoke to the, God, to the kings and prophets, and even sent this moon backwards in the sky. These men were taking the country by storm, and the religious and political leaders were terrified. They were getting so worried about this. They had already executed James, one of the disciples, and now they had Peter in prison, and they were planning his execution for the morning. So this group of disciples in, Je in Jerusalem, they met together to pray. This group had witnessed God moving in some miraculous and amazing ways. They'd seen every kind of sickness healed, every kind of deformity restored, and thousands of hearts be captured by the good news of the gospel. Uh, they knew that there were dangers out there. They'd seen one of their brothers get stoned to death. But they had also seen the power. Seeing Saul, one of the persecutors of the gospel, become a co-worker for their mission. So they pray. Uh, we, weren't, we aren't given insight into what their prayer time looked like, but about halfway through the prayer, they hear a knocking on the door. Frightened that it might be some soldiers to tear them out of their home and put them into prison as well, they send the smallest, the most fragile servant girl to go check the door. It's like the story about the bear. You only have to be faster than one. Um, as she approaches the door, she recognizes the voice, and she could not contain her excitement. Before she even got to the door, she turned around, sprinting back to the frightened group, yelling, it's Peter. That's what Rhonda said. He's at the door. But that's impossible, they said. He's chained up in a Roman prison under the careful watch of trained soldiers, and if you saw him, that's probably a bad sign because that means it's his ghost and he's dead. But the knocking didn't stop. And after a while, they finally decided to open the door. And standing at the door was Peter in the flesh. Awestruck, they invited him in. And he began to tell them how God had performed this miraculous jailbreak. How God sent an angel to release him from prison. How the chains just fell off as he followed the angel's instructions. How they just walked past the guards how they approached the iron gate and it just swung open, and how he thought himself it was just a vision because it's too crazy to actually happen, until he started walking down the block and this man disappeared. Bewildered, this group learned one thing that night, uh, that prayer works. Uh, today we're going to explore the power of prayer we aren't told that this group, how this group of Christians were praying back then. We weren't told that what they're doing in their prayer meeting. We aren't told that they open their Bibles up to Psalm 20. But one thing we do know is that the Psalms have been shaping the worship of God's people forever. Even today when people hold prayer meetings or worship nights, people will open, often open up to Psalms. The Psalms are a snapshot into the soul. The Psalms are raw emotion reinforced by the truths of God. It's people being real to God and expressing their hurt, their heartbreak, and their pain, handing it all over and submitting to the one who can actually do something about it. So this morning, we're going to dive into Psalm 20 and explore how this church in Acts 12 was shaped by these writings and how you and I can grow our relationship with the Almighty God. So uh, if you have your Bible... Open up to Psalm 20, and we're going to read it. Uh, psalm number 20. For the director of music, a psalm of David. May the Lord answer you when you are in distress. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and grant you support in Zion. 
May he remember all your sacrifices and accept the, your burnt offerings. May he give you the desires of your heart and make all your plans succeed. May we shout for joy and victory and lift our banners in the name of our God. May the Lord grant all your requests. Now I know this. God gives victory to his anointed. He answers him from his heavenly sanctuary with victorious power of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They are brought to their knees and fall, but we rise up and stand firm. Lord, give victory to the king. Answer us when we call. Psalm 20 begins and ends with the same request, for God to answer our prayers. Church, isn't that what we want this morning? Don't, we didn't come this morning just to sing some songs and listen to some dude come up here and deliver a monologue to how to, have, how to have a better life. What we want is we want to experience God. Jesus has come into our lives, disrupted our selfish agendas, and has opened our eyes to the fact that we need him in every area of our lives. We need him as parents when our baby ref- is screaming and refuses to sleep and wakes up every two hours. Just hypothetical. There's a reason why my wife isn't here today. Yeah. We need him as business people as we work honestly in a corrupt system. We need him as teachers who witness firsthand the brokenness and the pain of this world. And we need him in the medical room after we hear the hard news. Life isn't easy, and we need God. Uh, David, a man after God's own heart, understood that. His past experiences have shown him that life is difficult, and you need help in your darkest and most dire circumstances. Before David was king, he was on the run from King Saul, and he knew the only way he was going to survive this ordeal was through the help and power of God. In this work of poetry, after David pleads for answers and protection, he gets very specific in what he wants God to do. David asks for uh, help and support to be remembered and that his desires and plans will be met with success. In this model of prayer, David spoke plainly to God. David bore his soul before God, asking him to meet him in his times of trouble, praying boldly and specifically in what, for what he needed most. And that sounds pretty simple. Uh, but let's be honest. Um, being honest and open to God and letting him what you need to know is pretty difficult. Um, but isn't it kind of funny that the easiest and the most simple, clearest commands of the gospel are often the hardest ones to actually follow? Uh, how many of us here in our prayer time want to think, keep things as generic as possible? Um, I've been in a couple prayer circles, a couple prayer meetings, a couple prayer times where we go around the circle and a couple guys, specifically guys, I don't know why we find it harder, but it's true. We say things like, uh, pray for me because I'm going through a lot right now. Has, has anyone ever heard that, that line? Yeah, because it's pretty common. Uh, we've become so conditioned to just accept that response that we don't even think twice. And we just go to the next person in our wonderful little prayer circle. Uh, this morning, we're going to talk about why we need to move from those generic prayers to pray in a way that we actually believe that the Almighty God is listening and hearing us. We all know that prayer is the right thing to do. That's, as a Christian, we're kind of given that as given. Um, but what we know, just because we know something in our head, doesn't mean that it changes the impact on our hearts. Uh, so what's holding us back from this vibrant prayer life that David had? Why can David pray for blessing and deliverance from God? Why can the early church pray boldly for a miraculous deliverance? Um, there are numerous barriers to an effective prayer life, to an active prayer life, but today we're going to tackle three common barriers that keep us from bold and audacious prayer. The first uh, barrier that we come across is the barrier of performance. Uh, in Matthew 6, Jesus gives two examples of people who pray as if it's a performance. The first group pray using loud, vo- a loud voice and big words. They like to show off in front of all the people in their prayer circle. They use big, fancy, fancy theological words, thinking that God will listen closer to them just because they know how to say it, uh, because they know what they're doing. The second group prays as if they're trying to convince God of something. Um, I heard a story one time 
of another preacher who was in grade school who was super worried about a test. But instead of studying, he decided to go into prayer crafting mode. He spent hours writing out the most elaborate prayer, adding scripture to every sentence, using every big church word he can think of, making it super long and wordy, thinking that this is a surefire way to make sure that God blesses this test. He goes into the test sure that God's going sure to show up because you know what? If God is for me, then who can be against me? He, he gets his test back and he fails. And I'm sure God is looking down from heaven saying, dude, just study. <laughs> like, when we make prayer a religious act to impress other people or God, we have forgotten what the true sense of prayer is. Prayer is a conversation between a father and a child where we talk about our needs, our wants, our hopes, and our dreams. It's a child thanking their father for all the good things that they've done. The second barrier to effective prayer is confusion. Uh, generally, there are two camps when it comes to this. Either I don't know what to pray about, or, or sorry, I don't know how to pray, or I don't know what to pray about. Um, as a pastor, I, get pray- I got asked to pray for meals a lot. Um, an old pastor friend of mine called it one of the uh, professional hazards of this job. Whenever there's food to be blessed, I'm, I'm usually the man. Uh, personally, I find it really funny when people ask me to pray for Chinese food. I'm asking the Lord to bless our bodies with this food, and that's literally a miracle. <laughs> but there have been so many times where I've, asked, I've actually asked other people to pray for me, because, but I've been told that as a pastor, I make people nervous when they pray because when I'm around, they want to make sure they don't pray wrong. Church, pastors are not the only ones qualified to pray. Corporate prayer has not, cannot be regulated to those who hold formal church positions. In fact, we know from scripture and in church history, uh, when people in formal religious roles are the only ones praying and reading scripture, that's when the church gets its most distracted and its most corrupted. So, for the sake of your staff here, for the sake of our church health, pray, please. And I want to encourage you this morning that prayer is not an exact science. To pray correctly is to bring what's on your heart to God. If you need help figuring out what to pray, just look at the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6. Jesus gives us super, a super easy and simple guideline here. It just shows us if you have questions on how to pray, this is what we do. The same thing if you don't know what to pray about. Um, my general rule is if it's on your heart, you bring it to God. No matter how small or little it feels like, we should still pray about everything. God knows your hearts and desires, and he's not surprised or embarrassed that your prayer is too small. If you have something on your heart, bring it to the Father. The third and largest barrier is actually fear. And I've broken this one down into a couple key points because fear manifests itself in many different ways. But I have three potential fears that keep us from boldly and confidently coming to the Father. Uh, The first one is we're not sure if God's actually listening. Uh, If I'm spending time to talk to somebody, I want to make sure that they are listening to what I have to say. There's nothing more frustrating than when someone isn't listening. Uh, One thing you'll learn about me is that I have the spiritual gift of sleep. I'm already like the grandpa who can fall asleep if he sits on the couch for too long. God has given me this gift to sleep like a rock, and as great and as wonderful as it is, it's not the greatest when you have a newborn around. So the night after we got home, after Maddie was born, we were both exhausted. Uh, my, wait, my amazing wife, Tara, went through 32 hours of labor into an emergency C-section, and we spent four days in the hospital total. And after that time, we were ready for bed. Uh, during the middle of the night, Maddie starts crying, and Tara, like, a good parent, like the good parent she is, wakes up and begins trying to wake me up. She starts shaking me and says, John, our daughter's crying. N- nothing. John, wake up, she's hungry. No. Nothing. Suddenly, I sit up in my bed and I yell, there's too many babies! (laughs) And then fall back to sleep. After a little bit, I finally get up 
And I start walking to the bathroom. We don't keep Maddie's food in the bathroom. I turn on the lights, use the bathroom, wash, wash my hands, turn off the lights, and crawl into bed. <laughs> Tara's amazing. Despite the pain she was in, because she had severe abdominal surgery, she picked up our daughter, fed her, put her back down while her husband was there sleeping fast asleep. Just for the record, I remember none of this. I had to have Tara tell me the story because she remembers. God is not like a husband sleeping through a midnight feeding. God does not neglect his child while they're sleeping and crying out for food. First John 5.14 says, this is, what we have, um, this is the confidence we have in approaching God, that, we, that anything we ask, according to his will, he will hear us. Friends, God hears us. God hears the prayers of his people. There aren't too many things in this world happening that one can overwhelm God. If God got overwhelmed, he wouldn't be God. So God hears you and I. Our second fear is that we're worried if God even cares, and I want to squash that right now. Um, in John 3, 16, a very common, very famous, and very good verse, uh, it says, God so loved the world that God so loved the world that, yeah, he so loved the world. He not just loved the world, but he so loved the world that whoever, meaning you and I, believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. The entirety of scripture is God showing his love to his creation and wanting to restore that relationship to perfection like it was in the beginning. Our third fear is one that we don't really want to talk about, but it's a fear that we don't know what will happen if we do pray boldly and audaciously and with confidence and nothing happens. There is a fear that if God stays silent that we'll have to actually apologize for God. When we pray for healing and someone dies, when we pray for a promotion, we get fired. When we, get, when we pray for church growth and it gets sicker, uh, we're scared that people on the outside will ask, where is your God? And friends, this is a real possibility. Your prayers to God, you may pray to God and it may not get answered or might not be answered in the way that you're expecting. It's normal to wonder what God is doing in those moments. And it's natural to be confused and question what God will is. But that's who God is. Scripture says that God lives in unapproachable light, that his ways are above our ways, and that his will is always perfect, even when it doesn't seem like it. Sometimes God's will is different from what we pray for. And people begin to question that if God even exists, if God will even exist if he doesn't answer that one prayer. Uh, friends, I want to encourage you, that shouldn't shake our faith or discourage you from praying. Um, I can tell you that God is big enough to answer his own critics. In Job, when Job cries out to God, when, God is wonder, when he's wondering about the justice, when he's lost everything, uh, God takes Job on a journey. He reveals to Job just how vast and big and majestic and terrifying he really is. God's ways are not our own ways, and his thoughts are not our thoughts. So if God doesn't answer us or answer how we would like to, um, I chalk it up to the mystery of God. We can't fully understand this God in the short 80, 90, 100 years that we have on earth, hopefully. We can't hope to understand the unfathomable. Uh, but what I trust is that God, he's looking out for the goodness of his people. I shouldn't have to worry about apologizing for God because he can take care of his, himself. God has called you and I to honestly and boldly pray and leave the rest to God. Uh, so those are some reasons why that hold us back from effective and audacious prayers. So I'm going to share five reasons why we should pray boldly, pray specifically, and pray out there. Uh, my first reason that we should do that is because God's people have always prayed that way. Our story of Peter and the miraculous escape from prison is just one time where God's people got up and prayed crazy prayers. There are other stories like Moses who prayed for food and it literally fell from the heavens. There are stories like Hannah who prayed for a child and, it, and a child came. And then there are stories like Elijah who prayed that there wouldn't be any rain 
and there was no rain for three years. God's people have always prayed boldly. So why can't we this morning? God answered his prayers 2,000, 3,000 years ago, and he's, there's no reason why he can't do that today. The second reason why we pray boldly is that, that shows that as a Christian, we want what God wants. Or at least we should want what God wants. Romans 12.2 puts it this way. Do not be conformed to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. When we enter through God's fam- into God's family through Jesus Christ, we have a new mindset that places God's wants above our own. Uh, therefore, we trust or therefore, we pray, trusting that God that we are following God's will, and we have to be ready to change if our prayers aren't lining up with His will. Uh, the third reason that we pray boldly and honestly is because God wants us to. God wants to have a real and vibrant relationship with Him, and for that to happen, we have to have open and honest communication. Uh, the first sign of sin, way back in Genesis three, was when we tried to hide from God. Hiding from God is the exact opposite of what God wants us to do. So friends, just be honest. No, be honest. He already knows your heart. He wants you to be honest to him. Our fourth reason that we pray boldly and confidently is because we are God's people. David says that the Lord gives victory to his anointed. Um, so we have to ask ourselves, who are these anointed people of God? Um, there are two answers here. The first one's the king of Israel. So God had put the king of Israel to rule, uh, a king over Israel to rule both politically and spiritually as his representa- re- representative. Uh, in the Torah, it actually says that the king has to write out by hand his own copy of scripture. Uh, David, the king, was supposed to be God's representa- representative to the people. The second answer are his people. God's chosen people are often called the anointed ones um, because of the promise made to their forefathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. Uh, God promised to be with them. And today we know that God's people have grown. Uh, We're no longer limited to the Jewish subset, but it's to all people. Jesus, the true king, the true representative of God, has come, and through Jesus, we are all welcomed into his family. We have been given the promise that God will always be with those who accept Jesus as Lord, not just a single people group. And we can pray boldly and confidently because we know that we are the anointed people of God through the power of Jesus Christ. And because we're God's people, We can pray boldly because we can ultimately trust God. The text says some trust in chariots and some trust in horses. In ancient times, the horses and chariots were symbols of military might. If you had enough horses or chariots and you went into battle, that probably meant that you were going to win. It's like if they have foot soldiers and you have a tank. But what do the horses mean for us today? What are the horses of today? What do you and I trust in? Do we trust in money, in our jobs, in social standing, in your good looks and abilities? The list goes on and on. David says that we need to trust in the name of the Lord, and that means we choose to trust in God and give over complete control to him. Oftentimes, we will trust in God to deliver us, but we will actually hedge our bets. Um, If things are crumbling around us, We'll pray for God to deliver you and I, but we're holding on to something small that we can control. I'm not saying that we sit around and just ask God to do everything while we wait for the problems to be solved. What I am saying is that we need to put our full trust in, in God to deliver us. And that when we, and we do what he has called us to do, uh, it's fully God's plan for us. Yes, I have my part to play. But my part is to be obedient to God. If we are to succeed, it's because God moved. Church, if we're to succeed today, it's regard, in, whether it be in my personal life or this life as a community, if we succeed, we're going to succeed because God has moved and we have obeyed. 
Trusting in God gives a firm foundation. It's hard to trust God and leave everything in his hands. To leave the growth and health of this youth group into his hands. To leave the parenting of my daughter in his hands. To leave my marriage in his hands. To leave my finances in his hands. But God has shown himself to be trustworthy. God wants what is best for us. And he loves us and trusts and asks us to trust him and follow him as he acts out his will. So Greendale, as I close, what does that look like for us today? What will it look like for us to pray boldly and confidently before the throne of God? It looks like us discarding fear, confusion, and showmanship of prayer. If we want God to do something, uh, tell him. If you're dealing with sickness or pain, tell him. If you're dealing with heartbreak or hurt, tell him. If you want God to move in the lives of your friends and families, we tell him. Whatever is on our hearts, we bring forward to the Almighty God. And friends, I want to encourage you to share this with others. God knows that life can be difficult, and we can't do it alone. Bring everything to God, but also bring it forward to your church family. Uh, we don't want you to struggle alone, and we'd love, we'd love the opportunity to pray for you in these hard times. So this week, I have one takeaway. Can you guess what it is? Friends, pray. Pray. I know, rocket science. You can tell I'm really the youth pastor. (laughs) Pray expecting God to move. Pray knowing that God is strong enough to do amazing things. Pray knowing that he is trustworthy to act in a way that's best for his perfect plan. God does not want us to hide in shame or fear, but he wants us to humbly approach him. And you know what? We can tell dad what's on our hearts. And like the church in Acts 12, we may be surprised at how good and faithful and awesome our God is. So as I invite the worship team up, I'm going to pray. So you can close your eyes. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for coming to the cross. Thank you for suffering and dying for our sins so that we can have the open and honest relationship where we can bring everything toward to you, Lord. Uh, it can be scary to talk to uh, such a powerful and amazing being, but Lord, you have said you are. Uh, yeah, you want to hear us. You want us to approach your throne. So Lord, I pray that this week we can remember to pray. We can remember to be open and honest about what's on our hearts Uh, trusting you have the power to do something, knowing that your will will be done on this earth. In your name, Lord Jesus. Amen.